John, how can you always have the right TV for the right application without carrying hundreds of valves on your truck? You can carry the hundreds of valves on a trailer behind your truck. That's too funny. That would work, but how are you going to do that? Maybe there's an easier way. You can use Sporland's interchangeable cartridge style Type Q and Type BQ uh, TEVs. Type Q is a conventional design and Type BQ is a balanced port TEV. Well, come on, I need easy. How easy is it? Uh, easy is one, two, three. And it serves thousands of unique applications. So what's the process? How do I put this together? First, you select the thermostatic element assembly. Then you select the body that you need. Then you select the right size cartridge for the application to get the proper capacity TEV for your application. And then I guess it should also be said you want to actually assemble those to a single valve. That'd probably be a good idea. Indeed. These easy to select and assemble valves mean you're always carrying the right valve for the right job then. If folks want to learn more, what do they do? Uh, you can go to sporland.com and find more information on the Type Q and BQ thermostatic expansion valves. I guess that's Jim and John for Sporland signing off. Hello guys, this episode is brought to you by Fieldpiece. The tough wireless vacuum gauge MG44 from Fieldpiece is engineered to give you the reliable reading you need and the ease that you want. Confidently measure vacuums with a reliable leak-proof seal. The MG44 can be used with the JobLink system app from up to a thousand feet away. This easy to read backlit LCD offers a graphical representation of the vacuum progress even in low light or at odd angles. Visit www.fieldpiece.com for information or follow us on social media at Fieldpiece Products. Thanks again and enjoy the episode. We've all been there in the middle of a job, everything going smoothly until boom, you're missing a part. United Refrigeration is your one-stop shop for all your refrigeration needs. Use your computer or smartphone to go to www.uri.com at any time of the day or night to check stock on your favorite brands, such as Copeland, Sporlin, Carlisle Compressors, Danfoss, Emerson CPC Boards and Sensors, Carell, Hussman Parts, and k -Tetherm. United Refrigeration Inc. is home to these brands and many more. Looking for information on refrigerant conversions or refrigerant banking? Quick access links on the homepage can get you to the information you need. All approved accounts are able to see live to the minute inventory and pricing. Product not in stock at your local branch? No problem. Use the nearby stock feature to find a local branch that does have what you need. Are you looking for a branch address, phone number, or after hours number? That's all available as well. Just click on the branch locator and search for your local branch. Have a model number and looking for a replacement part? www.uri.com forward slash ARP has a vast list of quick pick replacement parts. Just search for the model number of the equipment you're working on and click the replacement parts tab. If you don't have an account, click the register button and we'll have you online in no time. With more than 400 locations in North America, each United Refrigeration branch is fully stocked for immediate pickup. Our branch employees have in-depth technical knowledge so we can help you get what you need when you need it. Visit your local store or www.uri.com forward slash ARP today. United Refrigeration Inc has all your solutions down cold. This uplifting cinematic experience. Uh, I've got something important to tell you, man. The big story is... Dig this and dig it.
got fat. The force is strong with this one. What are you, eight? Hey guys, question number one for the month of July. What is the total amount of steps in a CVS 17? Please email your answer to ARPGiveaways at gmail.com. This month we're giving away the Field Piece Vacuum Pump. Hello everybody and welcome to Advanced Refrigeration Podcast. We're here with your hosts Brett Wetzel and Kevin Compass. Yeah? Maybe. <laughs> How was your day today? Well, it's not horrible. I mean, I got, you know, said the, uh, had to meet a customer for, you know, some issues that the service department caused and uh, go through stuff like that. And then uh, I got sent to uh, help the service department some more and uh, they decided that they were going to send me to go work on a residential Split unit at a gas station, so pretty pretty easy day. And then uh, I actually drove all the way back to my house and uh, got to go to the closest door to my house, which is like five minutes away, and knocks some mice off of a freezer door. So actually today wasn't that bad. So you were actually home in a pseudo reasonable time. Yeah, like yesterday, I, w- I was home by one thirty. It was great. It is actually seventy five degrees yesterday. To really? forty degrees, colder, colder than it has been all you know the last two weeks. You know, and and everyone else is busting their ass and working a bunch of hours, and you're home by one o'clock. How is that fair? <laughs> <laughs> when I was your age, I put in one hundred and twenty hours a day. I don't know what you're bitching about. Yeah, and those old people are all broken and crippled and have no money. <laughs> So I, I was, uh, as you know, I was I was out in the field on Monday because you know someone decided to break my balls fully. Um, I left that my house. Great. <laughs> it's like a white buffalo in, in the in the <laughs> in the wild. He's actually out. Um, no, I was. Uh, it was actually funny because I was. I went out to the store with with Greg. And, uh, coincidentally, you know, we, we just put out the podcast, you know, this week for, uh, the dealing with high ambient with HFC. So thank you very much for anybody that's, uh, out there and was breaking my balls with the the pictures of just sprinklers. Like that's the go-to thing that everyone does. <laughs> so thank you for that. Oh, yeah, but it, especially right now. What's that? Especially right now. It's like <laughs> Oprah on this bitch. You get a sprinkler. You get a sprinkler. You get a sprinkler. <laughs> 14 well, connected Nate, family, you get six sprinklers and a booster pump. <laughs> well, like Nathan, Nathan Orr was busting, was busting balls. He's like, yeah, we just, we just put sprinklers. I was like that, man, I like, I get it. But like that, you know, once again, like we discussed, it should be the last thing. And, and like I said, coincidentally, it happened to be uh non condensables in the system. And it was kind of confusing. Cause you know, when the kid called me, you know, he's saying I got a zero degree TD and I, and I was like, that's kind of, weird and impossible and all kinds of other things and so i get out there and and you know we we figure out that we have i think it was like a 15 no i think it was like 25 degree td or something like that and and coming out of the uh drop leg we had actually had 15 degrees of subcooling that was the first thing that we spotted it was 86 degrees at 5 30 in the morning um and as soon as we, you know, we, we did the non-condensables test, we were approximately 10 degrees away um, from the actual saturated condensing temperature at that point, you know, versus the ambient. So, you know, like we discussed, it should be right at midpoint, right, you know, right on the, right on the, right on the nut. And uh, this wasn't, um, we re, uh, recovered the non-condensables until we got liquid going through the little sight glass on my gauges and lo and behold we did that for both sides and our pressure came down around 35 or 40 pounds uh sub cooling went from 15 degrees down to five and lo and behold she started chugging along it was funny because like the liquid injection lines 
were feeding crazy, like so bad. Like you can tell when they're overfeeding. Um, you know, typically you have a big ball of ice, you know, on the bottom of the, of the, uh, of the Y1037 valve. And we had that. And as soon as we did that, you know, obviously it lowered our discharge temperature from, you know, 250 or 260 all the way down to like 210 or 220. Um, so a lot of these valves weren't even feeding. They actually had uh, 240 degree uh, discharge uh, heads on those. Um, and just so you guys are aware, I know we were talking about, I just put out a short on explaining some of that stuff. And the the numbers on there all mean different things. So why, whenever you're talking about Sporlin, it's a special designation, it's a special valve. Um, 1037 is just their number for it. And then it typically has, the next number will be the tonnage. Um, and the next number will be the, uh, yeah, tonnage and then the actual temperature of what it's trying to control as far as the discharge. And they come in 190, 230, and I believe 240. And those are the only ones that I'm actually aware of. But that top portion, um, it's, it's like replacing a power head. A lot of times it'll snap off um, just because of vibration or whatever have you. And, and, um, so you can just pump down that system and just replace the head of it and it, it'll, it'll work just fine. It's just like replacing a, a power head on an expansion valve. But yeah, so I was actually out in the field, which was awesome because I'm, I'm tired of conference calls and Excel spreadsheets and, and I've been doing a lot of video editing for work as well. So that's been kind of crazy. But, um, today, really we're... That what's that? You really stretched that call out. Jesus. No, I didn't. <laughs> I was only there like an hour and a half, maybe, because um, we were checking everything else. But uh, tonight we are talking about, we're going back, way back, back into time. We're going to talk about uh, back to the basics. And uh, I have an idea where we're going to really go with this conversation, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let Kevin kick it off because, you know, Kevin's in a good mood and I'm wondering how many times he's, he's not going to be angry today. So let's hear it. Let's go. All right, so we had a lot of problems the last two weeks, and we had a lot of apprentices running calls that they probably should have been on. So, I mean, everything was burning. So, I mean, we, we were at the warm body effect. So, at this point, I want to go back to go over some of the basics because we had a lot of guys miss a lot of basic things. So when I'm talking basics, guys, I'm talking, you know, gauges, like what, what your gauges should be reading, what your, what your reading should be, like saturation, what, how to check superheat, like stuff like this. So in particular, we had like four or five calls that were all missed because somebody threw a set. That, I mean, I know where Brett's going to go with this and I'm going to have to hear it, but um, somebody threw a set of digital gauges on there. <laughs> and a set of testos and everything looked good. You check the superheat and everything looked good. You know, and it, but in this case, um, one of the stores was a, was a CO2 uh, pumped liquid skid. So, I mean, obviously you could have superheat on there, but it's not something you would be checking ever. Um, another one was a uh, bad EPR because the saturation on the gauges, he didn't know what it meant. He didn't know what to look for. All he knew is that the superheat said six. So that was a good number. So, yeah, it was actually 54 degrees, and it was trying to maintain a 34-degree box. But it had six degrees of superheat. So my, my question right off the bat, was it, were the gauges not calibrated? Was he on the wrong refrigerant? Or did he have any of the yeah, lines messed know. up? Like, you know, no, probes you or look whatever. At, you didn't even look at the saturation temperature. What? Yeah. So, didn't, I'm, I'm confused. What, what? What do you do? How are how are his the, numbers that that bad? He just saw the six degrees of superheat and thought it was good. Yeah. 
That's why I think guys should start off with analog gauges I, and a temperature sensor and do the freaking math. See, that, my, my whole argument you know, with this is like, if if you can't do your due diligence and look at the saturation, so number one thing you need to know, like when you're when you're gauging yeah, up something, no, number one thing that you need yeah. to know is fucking math. <laughs> the addition and subtraction is you know quite hard. My uh, my six year old could do addition and subtraction. If 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 my six year old has to do math for people, we have a problem. So my big thing here is guys. So before you gauge up to something. You should know, need to know what that reading should be. That, that that's a huge thing. Like if you don't know what it should read, how are you how are you gonna know what reading is good and not? So in this case, checking saturation, guys. You know, don't just throw a set of digital gauges on there and just look at the uh just look at the uh superheat. You know, take a look and actually look at the uh saturation temperature. You know, you want to see what that saturation temperature is supposed to read. So, say it's a it's a Husman case, and they call for a plus twenty SST saturated suction temperature. And they're calling for a plus twenty SST, and you throw your gauges on there, and it's at a plus fifty four. That ain't gonna cut it. You know, for an evaporator temp, it calls for a plus twenty. So you need to check that saturation temperature. Saturation temperature is super important like if if you guys are just throwing gauges on there and don't know what your numbers are supposed to be it's pointless same thing with like discharge pressure or suck or liquid pressure on a rack it's different a a rack you have schedules and you have set points but on some older stuff or older racks you may not have those ems or the schedules or set points so that's why having to know what you're you're looking at is like super important and know what you're actually working on So actually like looking at the saturated suction temperature or the saturated condensing temperature. You want to go over saturation, Brett, since you're the instructor. (laughs) So saturated suction temperature is, is basically the temperature that whatever corresponding pressure that you have is correlating with. So Oh, you're going to make me get a PT chart out because I don't, I don't want to give crappy numbers, but I mean, if we're talking about, you know, let's just say R22, I think 60 pounds is brought 30 or I'm sorry, 40 degree, uh, SST saturated suction temperature. Um, and basically that's, you know, that's what you're going to utilize in order to figure out, you know, in this case, we're, we're talking about superheat, right? And every single refrigerant has a different uh, saturated suction based off of uh, the pressure that it's running. And that's because a lot of these refrigerants, you know, have different characteristics, you know, whether they're made for medium temp or low temp, um, you know, what refrigerants they're actually made of. um, That's going to be also a big deciding factor of, of where your saturation is. So if we're talking, you know, CO2, CO2 at, I believe, uh, let's see, 25, 25 degrees saturated. I'm sorry, because I'm going off of memory here. 25 degrees saturated is approximately 450 pounds. Um, negative 25, or I'm sorry, uh, negative 22 is around 205 or 210, somewhere in that wheelhouse, I believe. And 87 degrees um, physical temperature would give you a pressure of uh, 1047. So, I mean, you know, and all these things aren't, you know, they don't necessarily have to be uh, linear, but, um, basically that's what saturation is. It's the, it's the pressure that you're taking, what refrigerant you're at and that temperature, uh, you know, that pressure converted to temperature, giving you the actual, you know, saturated suction temperature. Uh, typically, you know, we have what's called a TD on all of our evaporators. Um, you could basically say the normal, <laughs> sorry. Well then go pee. <laughs> um, oh my God. Oh uh, yeah. TD back to TD. So, um, 
you know, basically you can call most evaporators uh, have uh, an eight to 10 degree uh, TD. Um, so what that means is if you're trying to achieve 30 degree of box or space temp, you know, you want to basically have a saturated suction of eight to 10 degrees lower than that. So we'll just, you know, for even numbers, we'll just say 10. So that means we have to maintain a 20 degree SST in order to maintain the 30 degree discharge air temp that we're looking for. Um, you know, the older the case, um, typically the higher the TD. Um, you know, the old, old meat cases where, um, you know, the fins are really far apart. I mean, because that's basically what uh, what's being used to, to basically transfer that heat, right? So the copper has the refrigerant in it. It transfers the heat, uh, or I'm sorry, uh, it transfers the heat from the case to those fins, you know, and uh, pulls out the moisture and, and pulls out the heat from that case. And, and so we have um, on the older cases, older meat cases where the fins were, you know, let's just say an inch apart or three quarters of an inch apart, um, those cases had a 15 degree TD. So we have um, typically to maintain 30 degrees, we'd have to maintain a saturated section of, uh, you know, 15 in order to achieve that. So, you know, as we're trying to save more energy, we're trying to decrease that TD. So maybe in the uh, late, late 80s, um, early 90s, you know, they, they started making the fins a little bit closer together, which is going to give you more uh, surface area um, and let's be able to transfer uh, more heat from the case um, to the refrigerant. So they put more fins in there. Let's just say it was originally one inch. Now they put, I don't know, uh, maybe a fin every every half inch or you know a quarter of an inch and now those cases had a 10 degree td so now instead of actually having to achieve you know 15 degree saturated to maintain 30 now we could maintain you know 20 degree saturated to maintain 30. um and the good thing about that is if we're you know raising our saturated that also means we're raising our saturated suction temperature and so you have less compression ratio which means you're you know you're saving more energy um, later on down the line, I don't remember exactly when it came out, but you know, these cases started having a real low TD where they were doing anywhere from three to four degrees, um, of TD. So once again, if we're trying to maintain 30 degrees and for argument's sake, let's say we had a, uh, a TD of four degrees, that means we only had to achieve a saturated suction of 26 degrees in order to maintain 30 and what they did was they once again they started just you know throwing more fins per inch on those particular cases now we start running into problems with that you know the more surface area that you have the the more fins per inch you have um, is basically more of a chance that that particular case or coil is going to end up icing up so on these really high efficiency cases we want to make sure that we are running damn near right on what the saturated suction is calling for. A um, couple of reasons. One, uh, if we run a saturated suction of all the way down to, shit, let's just say 15 degrees when it's supposed to be 26 degrees, uh, not only is the coil going to be stupid cold and uh, hear more moisture, um, and frost a lot more than what it would if you had a 26 degree coil. Um, but it also then ends up affecting how the coil is actually sized, or I'm sorry, how the expansion valve is sized, um, because you're changing the characteristics on how that unit was actually originally designed. Um, so when figuring out, you know, what your saturated suction is or what it's supposed to be, um, that's when you, you know, you either look at the refrigeration schedule if you have one available. If not, you know, just calling the manufacturer and just getting a, a basic basic number of what they're really looking for. And they'll, they'll be able to tell you, oh, our pressure should be between X and X, which gives you a saturated of this. And that's that's all I do. If I can't find what the saturated section is supposed to be on a case, I'm basically just going to call the manufacturer if I can't find it on Google. Um, otherwise you're, you, you have no freaking idea. And the same Unless thing goes for us and airflow specs. So those just, those are just magic and don't exist. Yeah. I don't know why they do that. Um, 
So one of the uh, three biggest factors in in making sure a case is actually pulling down a temperature, and I mean this has worked for me for a very long time. I, I, I use the what's called the triangle method. Um, this is something that I came up with because it, it seemed to work really well. Um, think of a case of being a triangle, and that triangle is extremely strong if all three sides of the triangle are maintaining the numbers that it should. Um, I say that, you know, we have three sides of the triangle. So one side is uh, saturated suction temperature, making sure that that um, temperature that we're, that we're basically finding out via the pressure converted is right on with what it's actually calling for. So for argument's sake, you know, we're supposed to be at, you know, 20 degrees saturated. All right. Well, if we're at 20 degrees saturated, we move on to the next side of the triangle. Uh, the next thing that, that the next side of the triangle is the uh, airflow. Um, unless you're talking about Husman cases, a lot of them are usually either printed on the uh, print of uh, the tag of the case or it's in the IOM. Um, there's always a little asterisk typically next to what the feet per minute. Um, that's what we're measuring. We're not doing CFM. We're doing uh, FPM, which is feet per minute. Typically, you'll have, <clears throat> excuse me, you'll have uh, a certain amount of airflow. And there's, like I said, there's usually an asterisk next to it that says um, this, these numbers are only valid af directly after defrost. Um, the reason why is because as you start building up more frost uh, on those coils that are, you know, on the fins that are extremely close to each other, you're going to start building up some static pressure because, you know, now you're blocking it a little bit. So, you know, they say in their IOM, the airflow, the feet per minute has to be measured right after defrost, and that'll give you an accurate number. You know, you could be looking at anywhere from 150 feet per minute to upwards of 350 feet per minute. So once again, we move on. If, if the feet per minute, we get to the case, the feet per minute are spot on with the coil clear, then we move on to the last option. So the last side of the triangle, which I, I you know cover as the bottom, is being uh, superheat. So we have our good SST, we have our good uh, airflow, and depending on what type of case that you're working on, you know, uh, uh, my numbers are uh, three to five for low temp as far as superheat, um, six to eight degrees of superheat for medium temp. And sometimes those numbers can be a skewed based off of the manufacturer. I know Zero Zone is a big proponent on, even for their low temp cases, um, they tell you a, a superheat of six to eight degrees. So, you know, all those numbers I gave you as far as superheats, what I run, you know, that works 98% of the time. And then you have these rogue manufacturers who are like, no, it's a little bit different. So example, you know, the low profile meat cases, I'm sorry, meat boxes, meat coils that have the fans directly in the center and you have the coils on the side. Um, if you call heat craft, they'll actually going to tell you even running medium temp, they want the the superheat to three to five degrees. They want to keep that coil extremely flooded um, just so you, you know, you, you get enough surface area because the way the distributor is lined up, if you don't have enough superheat, you're going to end up starving uh, the one side of the coil. So that's breadth triangle, right? So in the way it works, right? If you have, if we have the right SST, um, we have the right airflow, but our case isn't still pulling down temperature, then the only deciding factor that could be contributing to that is the superheat. Um, like I said, if, if all three of the numbers don't meet up to where they should be, triangle collapses, case doesn't actually pull down the temperature. Um, so that's a good way to systematically go through the case by, you know, just sequence of operation and, and you know, hey, this is working, this is working, the only number that's askew is this, let's see what happens when we bring this back up or back down to temperature. Um, and, you know, you could have, let's just say you have bad airflow. It could be because of the coils I stuff could be because we have a bent fan blade. It could be that we have a bad fan blade or a bad fan motor for all that, you know, for all that said. Um, same thing with the saturated suction temperature, making sure that that's right. Um, if it's on a rack, you know, are the compressors cycling and off and on the way they should be to control that pressure? Is the dead band really high? Um, you know, basically the dead band is the number that, you know, gives you the cut in and cut in cut out for the next stage so for instance if you're trying to maintain 40 pounds and on cpc 
Um, their dead band, uh, if you say it's five, then it's basically two and a half degrees high, two and a half degrees low when we, you know, start and stop another stage. Um, and so it, if you're on a single system and you're not maintaining that proper saturated suction, I mean, you could have something wrong with the compressor. You could have something bleeding by, um, you know, you're just trying to maintain, you know, that correct saturated suction. The unit could be oversized. Um, maybe not if they've put 400,000 of these units out there and you're the only one that's having a problem. But I'm just saying that that's usually the way it works. Um, and then the same thing with the super. I've, I've heard that before. <laughs> Every other day. Oh, nobody else has reported this problem. Yeah, huh? Sure. And, and and that's the thing, like, you know, these people that, that question us about this stuff, like we talk to everybody. I mean, there's, there's, we talk to everyone, like, yeah. and, and people post the stuff that they're having the problems. I mean, that was the whole purpose of the pod, of starting the podcast, right. Was to, you know, try to assist and try to help these guys out in the field when they have problems like this. So it's, they don't think that we talk. You know what I mean? Like, I, I don't. We're all, we're all retarded, and uh, engineers are way smarter than us. And uh, yeah, and uh, you know, we're the peasants, and the peasants should just take the corn and leave. You know, I, I'm surprised it took 25 minutes for you to say something bad about an engineer. Um, so the the last part, last part, you know, with the excuse me, last part triangle. Yeah, sorry. Uh, so the last part of the triangle at the bottom, you know, it could have high superheat, could have low superheat. Um, obviously, it could be expansion valve issues, uh, could be block filter dryer, block screen. You know, any of those deciding factors could, you know, could mess up the superheat. But yeah, sorry, I drew that out really, really long. I apologize. <laughs> All good. I go with the square. I find it much more, uh, much more better shape than a triangle. Nope. Yep. This is it's, you got to add the last part, and it stores stupidity <laughs> because you, you always got to factor in the the store stupidity. You know, the first load line. What's that? Or we've always done it in this case. You're the first one to say anything. Uh huh. Or the uh, or the uh, or the uh, also common now OGP manager. Well. We're not going to keep the freezer door shut because we have customers to serve. Oh, okay. <laughs> I never, I never understood that. Like the, the other thing um, you'll have what are called case programmers. Um, those are the people that, you know, their job is to basically take the product that they're going to be putting in that case and make it really pretty. So making sure that you have this color over here and this color over here and it's this show. <laughs> well, because you're like, you need to move this product. Well, no, that's that's not it. Like, so on, on Hussman, yeah, I know they don't give you the airflow, but what they do give you, which is extremely helpful, is the orientation on how the shelves are supposed to be put in, right? So, you know, they'll tell you that the first shelf needs to be a tenant shelf and it needs to be four and a half inches off the bottom of the honeycomb. And then they'll give you the next shelf. It's supposed to be a 12 inch and that needs to be an additional eight inches down. So, and it's true to form. Like if you if you look at the case and if you were to put that one case, you know, the 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 12 inch case or the 12 inch shelf that's 12 inch deep and you move that up to where the other one is, it'll be intersecting the load limit line and you're just going to blow all that air um, out of that case. Uh, Husman, Husman cases, the shells get messed up all the time. And I don't know how many times that, oh, we don't have those shells anymore. We tossed them out. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Gonna pay some uh, ridiculous prices for some stamp sheet metal. Hussman is damn proud of their metal products. Let me tell you. Metal? Oh my god. They why? You know how much a bunker clip is? You know those like clips that hold the shelves in the bunkers? Yes. $85 for one clip. The wire that hold the wire racking shelves. And that's our cost. Hey guys, today's episode is sponsored by Westermeyer Industries Serviceable Oil Floats. Many oil separators contain an oil float to effectively meter separated oil back to the compressors. Westermeyer Industries has taken this concept and perfected it. With their new line of serviceable oil floats,
These floats feature an improved design with fewer components, allowing for greater manufacturer consistency and up to 20% increased oil flow versus their legacy models. These floats also feature an integrated magnet to shield the oil path from debris and have been field proven in supermarket applications. Westmeyer Industries offer replacement oil floats not only for their own separators, but also cross compatible models for our competitor oil separators as well. You can find out more about the Westermeyer Industries serviceable oil floats by visiting westermeyerind.com backslash floats. Once again, that's westermeyerind.com slash float. Let's get on with the episode. Wow. For a stamped piece of 16 gauge steel. And what, 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 I don't even know what they're used for. What are they used for? The, you know, you know, the wire, like a, say uh, you have a Hussman coffin case, you get the wire mm-hmm. shelves. Okay. That go on the bottom. The, the 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 clips that go in the back wall that hold the shelf the, the 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 little the shelf little feet sit in the little square clips they run across the it, you got to take out that like you end up like seventeen of them in a in a twelve foot case when you got to de ice it for the four hundred time yeah yeah those eighty five dollars a piece that's kind of ridiculous yeah we have a Walmart store where they probably go through about a hundred a year. Mm-hmm. You know, because what? they just, yeah, they just lose. I don't know what the fuck they do with them. They lose them, they throw them away. You show up there and there's milk crates in the cases, just pushing down on top of the, on top of the, bla- the plastic pans. Yeah, I, that's another thing I'll never understand about Husband cases is those plastic pieces. Junky that, pans. That end up getting just demolished because someone will put it in or we've cracked a fan blade or something like something always happens to those what did you end up just telling me about uh one of those uh oh there's uh there's certain ones where they were uh we were having problems with the uh the fan blades were too close to the uh the black plastic pans and it was causing the fans to cavitate yes yes where you uh, didn't you say it was like a real high aesthetic pressure or whatever yeah, so we ended up taking rulers and bending them in half and uh, making them into L's and raising them up a little bit. Wait, 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 wait. bending what? Bending rulers. I went and got some metal rulers off a shelf, and uh-huh. I bent them into little like uh, standoffs, and uh, we stuck them in the case, and then it worked. And then Husband came out there and said all this other stuff was wrong. The the branch did, and then the guy took them off, and then the case went down. He looked like a jackass, and then. Uh, I put the rulers back and everything was back down the top. I'm trying to and figure then, out where I'm trying to figure out where you're like I'm 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 envisioning a ruler. We put it we I, I bent it and I bent it into a U. So it made standoffs. Okay. So I made standoffs to hold the pla- plastic pans up like another inch and a half. Oh, oh, okay. Look at that. I come back and there's different pans in the case. <laughs> Is there is there is there like a, a national something or other where they're you know they're they're acknowledging that they actually have a problem? God no, they don't do that. <laughs> no, these are going to do that. They just hide it until uh, they don't want to get sued because all these customers want things for free all the time. That's not true. <laughs> we just get blamed and they just we never heard of that before. Even though we were just dealing with it twenty minutes ago. <laughs> Either that or it's Kevin sh- shitty programming. St- I'll fucking stab you. <laughs> I didn't mean to curse. What? I didn't mean to curse. Edit that out. <laughs> Leave it in. Wholesome, wholesome podcast. All right, guys. So, like, back to the basics. Now that Brett went on this this, this triangle, you know, diatrage that like ended up in the middle of nowhere. Oh. Uh, so back to the basics, guys. Checking saturated temperatures, checking your your drop legs. I'm a big thing about this. Like if I'm walking through a mechanical room, I'm grabbing drop legs on racks or like single units. Cause I see a lot of guys miss single units at all day. Like they walk by, they don't grab a drop leg. Grab a drop leg. If the drop leg's steaming hot in the summertime, you should probably go check the condenser and go see how plugged up it is. You know, if it's 
if the drop leg's hot enough to burn your hand, that's a problem. That's something you need to you need to check out. So, what is so funny? Because the way you said, I just walk up to it and grab the drop leg. The only thing I'm thinking about is like a couple of years ago, the, the the whole Trump thing, and that's the only thing I can think of. What you're saying, I just walk up and just grab it and see if it's. Grab my drop leg. What? Just walk up and grab by the drop leg. <laughs> that's why I was laughing. I'm sorry, child. All right, my bad. Go ahead. God, you're a child. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just walk by, grab a drop legs, you know, grab a suction line, you know, make make sure that, you know, you don't have something that's, you know, smoking hot in the suction, you know, or like the liquid line. I mean, that's a big thing. It's easy. You know, grab it and then, you know, okay, th- this, this, this unit, you know, has a drop leg. It's like 120 degrees. This one's 90 degrees. Well, we got a problem here because they should both be pretty close in temperature. So we should probably go take a look at the other one, you know, get hop up on the roof. And if you're working on single units, it stores the single units or like a rack, get up there and check the condenser. The easiest thing you could do, especially when you're new in this trade, is to clean something. You know, that is the easiest thing to do. And, you know, that's one thing to take off the list. I mean, even if a condenser shot, wash it off. They'll just throw a sprinkler on there. Wash it off. Get get whatever airflow you're coming out of there. Um, make sure that, that, you know, you have airflow. Make sure that, you know, the fans are all spinning the right way. For God's sakes, last week I found six condenser fan motors spinning backwards. So one of the biggest things when I, when I did that call um, in the morning was the fact that even though the head pressure was exuberantly high, um, when I was feeling for airflow, there was no heat coming off of that off that condenser at all. So I mean that's telling you right off the bat that you're not really rejecting anything. And that was, you know, that was obviously due to the non-condensables, but you know, just be aware when you know when you feel across a, a, a you know any condensing unit. Um I would I had a leak in, in my residential one at the house and, and I would go over it and I'm like, uh, I think I'm low on charge because it was stupid hot in the in the house, but I, I Basically, didn't well, have clear any, any right here. He had a leak in his house for like a year. It did not. You, you did too. You had to have an apprentice go over and charge your air conditioner back up when you were out of town. That was at the beginning of this year. And the last one I replaced the coil. I don't want to hear any shit about it. <laughs> Um, same thing with the, uh, you know, I know we've talked about this a million times, but same thing with the, uh, condenser when trying to figure out what the pressures are going to be. And that's, I'm only bringing this up because that's one of the biggest questions I get all the time. What's my pressure supposed to be? Um, single units and split units. We typically have a TD of 20 degrees. So once again, if it's hundred degrees outside, my estimated saturated condensing temperature should be approximately 120 degrees. Now, some new stuff is 10 to 15 on, on, on single units. Really? Especially micro, yeah, especially micro channels. Hmm. So once again, I mean, 20, 20 is my, my estimation go-to if I don't know the actual number. Um, same, same thing with uh, rack, rack condensers, right? We're talking about uh, low temp. We're typically anywhere from an 8 to a 12 degree TD. And for medium temp, we're going to be medium temp rack. We're going to be anywhere from uh, 12 upwards of like 18 degree uh, TD on that condenser. So remember, you're, you know, whatever your discharge, I'm sorry, whatever your ambient is. And it's you can't just go off of the temperature sensor uh, that's reading on the E2. Um, always make sure, always verify that that's correct because you also have the heat coming from the roof. So depending on where that temperature sensor might be, um, that might throw off the whole operation of, of, of that particular system. Case in point, I had a, a condenser that was running really, really high pressures. And it, what the weird thing was is that it had a floating head strategy and it had a set point of some stupid freaking high. And it was because the temperature sensor that was supposed to be measuring 
uh, the uh, ambient air. And, and just so you guys know, the location of this temperature sensor is extremely important. Typically, we put it underneath the non-splitting side of the condenser. Okay, so the full, you know, the full year-round side of the condenser that's going to have flow. And we put it on the first fan closest to the header because that fan should be the first one on, last one off. So you're not going to get these, you know, set point changes because you're going to have a fan, you know, shut off in the middle of the, uh, in the middle of the condenser. Um, I don't know why, but a certain customer does not put it right by the header. Um, they show you on the print on where to put it. And a lot of times in the middle of, you know, whatever, it'll, it'll shut off. And then there might be a five to 10 degree difference of what the TD, I'm sorry, what the ambient air is, what it's reading and what it actually is. You know, it's dependent on how much air that you're pulling across, um, you know, that temperature sensor. So once again, the, you know, that to figure out what the high side should be, contact your manufacturer or look at the refrigeration schedule and make sure that, that it is reading exactly what you're, you know, what you're reading. But for the most part, you know, if you can't find out, call the manufacturer and that'll give you an estimation on where that pressure should be. Um, on rack refrigeration, we typically try to shut off the uh, compressors uh, when the saturated condensing temperature gets up to about 125 degrees saturated. Um, you know, so that might be 350 uh, PSI, where on a single system, you know, their, their high pressure switch can't be that low. Um, because, you know, in, in rack refrigeration, we have multiple compressors and we have multiple condenser fan motors. So we're able to control the pressures and the temperatures. Um, a, a single unit is usually just cycle itself to death, especially if it's a newer heat craft unit with like uh, automatic reset, high pressure control. It will just cycle itself to death. So, I mean, that, that, that brings us into this next thing. OK, just because a condenser looks clean does not mean it's clean. Now, case in point, we had, a, we had a store where we were at multiple times and we actually lost a compressor on a single unit because it kept cycling and cycling and cycling on high pressure. And then there were sprinklers on some of them. I mean, these things are beat up. The condensers are pretty folded over. We're above ambient design, but they were still running like extremely hot. So I I washed them and I got a little bit of stuff out. It was dirty. I mean, it wasn't like super dirty though. Not as dirty as I was hoping it would be. So then I went and got some new bright and I took the took it by the gallon and I dumped it straight down the center of the condenser coil. And this thing started smoking. And I started, you know, I let it sit for a few minutes. I started washing it out. And you would not believe the mud coming out of this condenser coil after it boiled out for like 10 minutes, 15 minutes with a new bright on there. This thing, I mean, there were chunks falling out of this thing. Like that, I mean, we power washed this thing for like 10 minutes before this. I mean, we power washed it through the backside, through the front side, through the backside again. We got some stuff out, but nothing compared to when we dumped that new bright on there. We dropped the head pressure another 55 pounds. Really? Yes. I mean, you got to remember, like, a lot of rack condensers don't get chemicals put on them. So, I mean, they they just don't. I mean, they're usually not near exhaust fans with grease, you know, so they're not getting cleaned like that. They're usually just getting cleaned with water, which is fine. But every couple, every couple of years, you need to, you know, dump some chemical on here and free up some of that dirt that, you know, that's on these fins, aluminum fins. I mean, because that you get that dirt film on these fins and you're 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 cutting down on your heat transfer. So like big thing, like if you guys are walking up, especially if you're newer, if you're walking up to a condenser and it's not blown straight out the back or straight up, you know, out and it's blowing off to the side of the fan shroud, you know, if you put your hand in the fan in the side that's blowing out and not blowing out the top, then you know that that condenser is impacted and plugged. That motor is cavitating. When it's doing this, it's increasing the amp draw on the motor. Now, it doesn't seem like it means a lot, but for example, your typical six fan condenser at an Aldi, it'll increase the amp draw by nine amps at full wow. tilt. Wow. So, 
Yeah, uh, because you can you, you can actually graph it on the drive because they're looking at the uh, M400. You could graph out the drive amps. So you will drop if you wash the condenser off, and by the time it dries out from what it was running before when it was plugged with cottonwood, it's generally eight and a half to anywhere from nine and a half amps. So you're increasing the the, the the heat on the motors, you're in, while wow, wearing down the motors because now they're cavitating and over amping. That is the number one reason condenser fans fail is plug condensers. You over amp the motors and then they start cavitating. Then they get shakes and it causes bearing issues. It causes the, uh, the motors to burn out because the windings overheat and they, they over amp, they run in their service factor on the motor and, uh, they run in there and then they start having issues with overheating. So that's that's another big one, guys. Like it just because a condenser looks clean does not mean it's clean. So just so you understand, uh, I'm just gonna unpack some of the stuff that Kevin was saying. So if you're not aware, service factor is basically a number um that gives you a, a little bit higher of an amperage allotted. So you know, you're going to have a little bit of inrush and, and, you know, it might run a little bit higher in amperage, you know, not the actual FLA or the RLA um, that's la label on there. Typically, most motors that I've seen, 99% of them have a service factor of 1.15. Um, what that means is you take the FLA, um, let's just say it's 5 amps. Um, you multiply it by the 1.15 and that will give you your amperage that you're allotted with that service factor. Um, about the airflow, remember if you have a condenser fan motor that's not running, um, you know, that will also affect, um, the airflow in total. Cause I mean, it, instead of pulling just like anything, uh, you know, it's going to go, any of the air is going to follow the path of least resistance, right? So if we have a condenser that has a lot of, a lot of fins in it and you have a condenser fan motor that's out, it's going to preferably just pull the air out from the other condenser uh, fan fan motor that's not running, it'll just pull it out from the from the top and just not go across the coil, which could potentially cause you to have higher pressures. Um, but as well as when a condenser fan is blocked, um, as far as the coil, um, that air is just sucking in from the top and blowing back out the top, and so no air really is getting pulled across um, that uh, that that condenser coil. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a big thing. I, I'll walk on a roof. Say I'm on a roof, I'll walk by, just throw my hand over the condenser, you know, and see if the air is coming straight out or if it's coming to the side. I mean, on a single unit, yeah, make sure it's clean. I mean, get the fin comb out if you can. Obviously, you're probably not going to fin comb out a rack condenser. Um, but, you know, fin comb out a single unit, it doesn't take that long. What's up, Brett? Uh, so fan cycling as well. Um, this might be seem really dumb to bring up, but it does really make a big difference. So you have some coils that just have, you know, one, uh, one fan on the left, one, uh, you know, one fan on the right. Um, Husman, uh, Husman are crack condensing units. Uh, they can have four, five, six, eight fan motors on that condenser uh, that's laying up uh, vertically. And follow you know in the iom guide they actually have the fan motors numbered and the way they have them numbered that's the way they want the condenser uh fan um, fan motors to turn on in sequence if you were to mess up that sequence um it's potentially going to cause um the sight glass to river um a lot of times it's because the 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 placement of it, uh, the pressure might drop a little bit lower than the, than the discharge pressure. Um, it just, it messes up the flow. I, I had a, <clears throat> excuse me, I had a box where this thing would uh, never pull down to temperature. And if it did, it just took a hell of a long time. And one of the main things that I did, because you can actually see the, the, I know this sounds dumb as hell, but you could actually see the, how low the superheat was. And then all of a sudden the fans would cycle in a certain direction where it would cause the rivering and you'd actually see the frost actually subside off of the suction line on the compressor because the the unit was actually on the on the top of the uh top of a walk-in and then all of a sudden you know it would shut off that one fan 
the sight glass would clear up and then all of a sudden you get a heavy, you know, heavy frost start building up on the suction line again until it cycled another fan. So just by setting those fans up in the direct or in the, uh, the sequence that they want um, will help with better refrigerant flow and potentially, you know, cause you less issues. I mean, especially something like that, uh, it would be really, really easy where you're saying, Hey, it's running high superheat. You know, you verify that, at that point, the sight glass did look little fine, and then you go down the evaporator, adjust it, and now all of a sudden you're you're flooding out intermittently, and you have no idea why. And it just might be something as simple as let's get the pressures, you know, set up correctly, and the sequence of operation as far as the you know which fan is supposed to shut off and turn on when, and that actually could potentially clear up a, a service call that you have going on.